We'll get to episode 212 in just a moment, but before we do, I'd like to ask for your support of the Keystone Chapter of the National Federation of the Blind of Pennsylvania. Go to supportkeystonechapter.org to make a donation. Any amount would be greatly appreciated. And if you can, check that box that says you'll also pay the fees. Again, that's supportkeystonechapter.org. Thank you so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. From Studio B in Swarthmore, this is the I Can't See You podcast with David. It's like blind people for dummies. Hello there, and welcome to episode 212 of I Can See You. My name is David, at David Benj on all the socials. I really do appreciate you joining me for this very special episode. But before we get into the specialness of this episode, let me just talk about one thing, which I promised I wouldn't talk about much, but we had a weird weekend and a strange turn of events. I have made it to the finals of the Frenemies League. And what's even cooler is the other blind guy in the half-blind, half-sighted league has also made it to the finals. Frank has made it with his Tungarian Pug Posse team. And I may be saying that name wrong, so forgive me, Frank. He does not change the name on that team, unlike his team in the All-Blind League. So Frank and I play for the championship this weekend, and I, I have to say I am a little bit annoyed. I tried to pick up Jacksonville's defense in the waivers this week, and I didn't get it. And it's not because Frank got them, the only other one who should really be trying for stuff, because there is money on the line here. I lost it to one of the guys who is playing for the third place game. They are that competitive over at Yahoo that they felt the need to upgrade their defense to try and win the third place game. So I'm annoyed at that. So I don't know what kind of defense I'm going to have. I just hope now that Jacksonville's defense doesn't score a ton of points and cost me the Frenemies League title. But we'll see how it goes. In hockey, I'm still in fourth place. I won 5-3. to three, And I am ahead this week, but... It's early and everything is still close. So I guess there's going to be at least one more week of fantasy sports updates next week. All right. Here is the special announcement from today's episode. And it's not really that special. But I do actually have a guest in Studio B with me sitting right next to me. And I'm standing, so I'm not sitting. She's sitting. I'm standing. To talk about the craziness that went on over the last few days of her move... It's Jane. Hi, Jane. Hello. (laughs) She usually talks a lot more. I've never done this before. Well, that's good. That's why I want you to do it. I have told her since she was in seventh grade, and she's now almost 26 years old. Since she was in seventh grade, she should have started something on YouTube, but she didn't. Could have been Emma Chamberlain. I don't know who that is. Well. Is she beauty, fashion? What is she? Uh, she has a coffee company. She's partnered with Louis Vuitton. Celine, she walked and hosted for Vogue at the Met Gala. She was on Architectural Digest videos for her home. She's done a lot. Okay, but did she start on YouTube? Yeah. Okay. All right, well, Jane is here to talk with me about our adventures first of Saturday when she and I went up to New York City to go to her old apartment and take some things to her new apartment and more specifically to get her keys for the new apartment for her move, which was yesterday. And it was quite an adventure, would you say? Yeah? Yeah. (laughs) So we were originally scheduled to go up on the 23rd, which was Friday, two days before Christmas. As I told you last week, we recorded on Friday instead. I recorded on Friday all by myself, right here in Studio B, as it usually is. But I have another announcement to make at the end of the episode. We didn't go up on Friday because of the rain. There was torrential rain. There was flooding in New York. There was flooding in Philadelphia. And then it all ended as snow. And then she and I decided to go on Christmas Eve, which there was no rain, but it was really, really cold. Really cold. (laughs) Thanks for emphasizing that. (laughs) We decided, well, I decided, Jane would have had Liz take us to 30th Street Station in Philadelphia, and then we would have gotten the Amtrak train there. However, had we done that, we would not have taken the train that we had the ticket for. But back to Swarthmore. I wanted to take the train into Philadelphia from Swarthmore because it's silly to have Liz drive us all the way in when there's a train that we could jump on less than a mile from our house. 
We go to the train station around 10 or 15 minutes early. We sit in the car because the temperature was around six degrees. The wind chill factor was somewhere below zero. It was cold. And we sat in the car and around three minutes or so before the train was to come, I got out of the car. I tapped my card because on SEPTA, the regional rails, you tap in at the station, they scan your card or tap your card on the train, and then you tap out at the end. And... I tapped in, and then Jane got out of the car. We got the empty suitcase, and we'll get back to that empty suitcase in a minute. And then we stood, and we waited and waited, and there was a delay. And we waited were... outside. Yes. We forgot to mention. Yes, this is all outside now. There's no place. On, on the weekend, they don't open the station, and there is a little station there. But on the weekend, they don't open that. They don't unlock it. Again, outside, and now it's 9.30, And then 9.35, and things are starting to go numb. And we decide, well, let's just go check to make sure the station was open. Just because we would have felt really dumb if it were, if it was open and we didn't check. It was, like I said, locked. And then we waited some more. And then more body parts were freezing. And I couldn't even, (laughs) I couldn't even use my phone because my hands were so cold, I couldn't hold them. I was trying to keep one hand in my pocket and try and do it with my thumbs. Didn't work. Finally, another passenger who was supposed to go into New York came over and said, well, I just ordered an Uber. Now, now this guy, a little crazy, Jane, what do you think? Yeah, also, I'm not getting in random people's Ubers. <laughs> he was also going to 30th Street Station. There was another guy there waiting, and he said, oh, you don't have to worry. Everything's going to be delayed anyway from all the ice problems. And that was the, the the main issue was a lot of switches were freezing on our train. In fact, when we went in, we slowed down at one point, the conductor puts on a vest that you see when they march in Paris, the yellow vest that those guys wear to um, in Paris when they're protesting, but most people when they're doing road work or whatever, and he gets off the train, he goes to the street where the gates weren't coming down. And I guess the lights weren't flashing and stops traffic. The train then slowly goes through the intersection, across the road, and then the guy gets back on the train. And how many times do you think he did that? Once or twice? How many? Mm, I think he only did it once. Okay. Uh, but there was times that they slowed down and maybe even stopped before we got to a station. And that's how it went. And that's why the train ended up being 20 minutes late. And, of course, we're panicking that we're going to miss our train. So when we got to 30th Street... We hustled off the train and saw the line for the 923 Amtrak train to New York. And when Jane looked at the schedule, and this, is the, this was the beauty of having Jane with me. I wouldn't have been able to tell what was going on. She looked at the board and it said delayed. No time, just delayed. <laughs> and all the other ones that were delayed had times. So that was a little weird, we thought. So... We thought, let's go ask. And what did the lady say? She said, it's delayed. I don't have any more information to give you. We're like, you don't have any estimate? And she said, nope, that's just what it says. So I thought that was kind of weird because, and, and Jane did as well, and she's obviously taken the train to New York a lot more than I have. But all the others, like I said, had time. So did the train crash? Is it like when you go to the airport and it says sea agent? Nobody knew. Nobody knew where the train was. Nobody could tell us where the train was. Jane scoured social media, see what was going on, and and couldn't find anything. So we sat there and figured, what are we going to do? At this point, it was too late to get on the 923 because we wouldn't have been able to switch our ticket in time and then get in the queue and, and get on the train. And who knows if that would have worked anyway because it looked pretty packed, would you say? Yeah, and it was at the point where the line was already starting to board, so who knows where in the process they already were in terms of boarding. Right, and because that 920 train was delayed, a lot of people probably had already done that exact same thing. Uh, And again, it would have been too difficult to do everything and then hop in the line and actually find seats on the train, at least somewhat together. And we didn't have a little suitcase with us. This suitcase was probably two-thirds the size of me. So finding (laughs) space for both of us and the suitcase was not likely with that train. We should see if you could fit inside that. I probably could. (laughs) So we waited, and then we decided to go over to the ticketing agent to see if we can get on a train that was listed for 1030. And in the meantime... 
the, Go. Be, the, we did the 1031 because the 1025 train also going to New York. This was probably like 925, 930 at this point. That one was already delayed 55 minutes by the time we got in line. Right. And I think actually we walked over to Duncan. Yeah. To, I, I ended up getting a hot tea, which... Unfortunately, the folks there at Duncan, it was the weekend crew, and they didn't know who I was. Every time I go there during the week, they always remember what I get uh, because of my time at the blind bodega. But after I got the tea, we ended up going over to the ticket agent. And the funny thing was, when we decided to take this 1030 train, we thought, okay, let's go over there. The girl says, oh, well, that's delayed. I don't know. What was it, 22 minutes? I think, yeah, it was 1052. She goes, oh, it'll actually port at 1052. So we thought that was kind of funny, but okay. And then we, then we thought, Jane said to me, you know, maybe we shouldn't go because we're scheduled to come home at 5.17 that day. So how much time are we going to have? We had a limited amount of time. We didn't know if there were going to be delays once we were on the train. We didn't know how it was going to be in New York with traffic and getting from downtown to uptown, uh, Christmas Eve and everything. And again, it was very, very cold out. We waited and around, I don't know, around quarter after 10 or so, People actually, you saw people lining up before that, right? Yeah, I can't remember when I noticed, but because they generally board the same trains on the tra- same tracks, you can kind of gauge which ones are going where, and that is what happened. Where people started queuing up, even though it's like maybe this is the one going to New York. <laughs> and so, of course, we went over to the uh, agent at the top of the stairs, an escalator, to see to to verify that that was the train to New York. And she said, yes, the line starts back there. And she pointed. I don't know if she didn't know what a white cane was or what the story was. And then she said, well, do you need help going down? I said, no, I I think we'll be okay. And I asked Jane if she wanted to take the elevator. And she said, there's elevators? We took the elevator. So she had suggested we go over to the red cap. And then I think she wondered as we were walking away and I started swiping with my cane, oh, maybe there is something up with that guy. And said, do you need some help? Because normally what's happened in the past when we used to go up, when I would, you know, after college, is we would stand on the side opposite of where the line is. And that's where if you have priority boarding or you're a family or you're disabled, you're able to board first. So we stood over there because we wanted to board first because... We wanted to sit together. We wanted to sit together and he is disabled. And she was like, oh, the line's over there. Like, we know where the line starts, but... And everybody else, again, I, I don't know that she realized what the cane was when we were standing there talking. Maybe I was talking too normally or, or what. I don't know. Uh, but we ended up going to the red cap. And when we got over there, it was kind of funny. He said, oh, what train are you on? And we told him. He said, oh, we got to go. And we immediately went over to the elevator, went down the elevator. And uh, did he help us get to the train or did he tell us where to go? What, do you remember? I think the elevator just took us to the platform and he said it's on the left. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sometimes they actually take me onto the train and say, watch me bump my head and say, that's a good spot to sit right there. <laughs> the nice thing was we sat in the handicap seats again, not that we needed to, but they were right there. They were the first ones on. And the best part about those, they have no seat in front. So you can stretch your legs. We actually had our suitcase, the big empty suitcase, <laughs> was sitting right in front of us so we could keep everything together. I ran my cane through it so it wasn't flopping around or laying on the floor. And it just made it a lot easier gutting off as well. And I guess we should say at this point why we had the empty suitcase. I have a lot of clothes. (laughs) So we were going to fill the suitcase up and fill another bag up with the clothes that's in her dressers and take them in an Uber to her new apartment. And obviously the suitcase on wheels was the best option instead of putting it in boxes or anything like that. And this way we wouldn't have the movers have to move it and wonder if one of the boxes got lost, what was missing. So we took the train. The train ride was pretty uneventful. I don't remember any major stopping and it didn't take long. We got into New York just a little afternoon, a couple minutes afternoon. And the best part about having Jane with me, other than the company... <laughs> was getting out of the train station. As I've mentioned countless times, just about anywhere in New York, you can use something on your phone to figure out where you are and where you're going and whatnot. But inside Moynihan Train Hall, it's almost impossible, or well, for me, it was impossible to find the exit and to figure out where we were going to leave the station and where we were going to be out on the street and so forth. So 
with Jane, she said, oh, the exit's right over there. It was that easy. So I should have always had a, a guide with me, maybe. But now I know, and we, uh, later on, we did a lap around there so I could see what was where, and that, that made it very easy. It was packed, would you say, at, at Moynihan when we got there? Yeah, it was really busy, and it was so busy that people were just sitting on the floor everywhere because there's no place to sit in the actual station. You have to sit on the outskirts, which was also packed to the brim. And most of those seating areas around the edges have to do with where there's some sort of food place or food court. That's where everybody was. And then everybody, like Jane said, sitting in the aisles, standing in the aisles. I wish I had gotten video, I realized, as we were leaving. But again, we were kind of pressed for time. I should have shot video then for just listen. But I did afterwards on our way home, and I got some. Not as exciting because it wasn't nearly as packed at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on Christmas Eve. It still was pretty busy, would you say? Yeah, I would say it was probably regularly busy. We get out of the train station. We go over to the TD Bank that is <laughs> always seems like the go-to uh, when we get off the train there and something's going on. Because when Jane first went up to New York after college, I went with her because she had to put a deposit down on her apartment. Was it a depo- the, the security deposit in, I guess, first month? And I think the broker fee. Oh, and, and the broker the fee. Right, right, right. check or verified check, whatever it's called. Right. So we did that same TD right, right there on 33rd and, <laughs> and 8th. And we went into there. She used the ATM because she wanted to get some money for her doorman at her current building for Christmas. And did you, so you still have a couple you have to give, yeah? I just have to give my super now. Oh, that's it? Okay, yeah. good. So we did that, and as we come out of the bank, and it is so windy, and I had a winter coat on, uh, I had a hoodie on underneath, and then I had a normal fleece shirt and a turtleneck on, the hood was <laughs> was puffing up and blowing off, and I couldn't get over how much colder it felt there than even when we were standing in Swarthmore waiting at the station. I don't know if it was windier, I don't know if it was because it wasn't it wasn't sunny. It was sunny, but again, the tall buildings were mostly blocking where we were. And then we looked for a cab. And this is where the adventure began and where we're going to get the title for this to see if it helps <laughs> with the downloads. Yeah, and everyone was queued up because normally when I leave, I'll take the subway because it's easier. And normally I don't have a lot of stuff to take with me. So it's connected. So I just go to the underground and I will take the 2 3 or the AC, whatever is closer to being on time or running at all. So when we left the station, sometimes it's a grab shoot, getting an Uber, getting a cab, flagging down a cab, but then you're near Times Square, so the lights are off, it's a whole thing. So being that we left from Moynihan, there was a queue of taxis in between Moynihan and MSG. So I was like, sick. So we're walking down. I thought we were going to need an SUV, but this one hybrid, I don't know what kind of car it was, he like waved to us and the bag ended up fitting and... We're driving, and the cab driver goes, can I ask you a question? I'm like, oh, my God, what is this man about to ask us? And he's like, why do you have an empty suitcase? First of all, sir, please don't (laughs) ask me any questions. Um, And I was like, oh, we're just bringing it somewhere. And then Dad jumps in. He's like... I I should have said, and I'm disappointed I didn't think of it sooner, uh, we have a body to dispose of, and we need it for that, to see what he was would do or say and but I didn't I said we just have to we're gonna fill it up and take it somewhere else it's like you don't know what well at first he said we just pack really light and the cab driver was like really (laughs) sir just please just drive so we needed to go he ended up taking us down to FDR to go downtown and FDR is like an expressway on the east side of Manhattan so we went from 8th Ave across the island to get on FDR instead of just driving down 7th and cutting down the island. And maybe there would have been traffic. I don't know. I don't drive in the city. So we took us down that way, merged terribly. Right. Cars beeping at him and everything else. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe we're not even going to get to the apartment. And this has happened before, but it's happened not in this extent. But to get off, you need to get off, uh, you know, right near Brooklyn Bridge. And as with what's happened before, in a similar <laughs> instance, he missed the turn. Before, I've gotten gone from downtown, going downtown on FDR to going uptown, so then we just have to go through Lower East Side, whatever, loop back around. This man somehow managed to put us on the Brooklyn Bridge, which is going into a different borough than where I live. So he then, like, mumbles, 
he was like, oh, you can pay now, so you don't have to pay extra, as if we were going to pay extra because he's going to drive us through Brooklyn to get to my apartment. And at first, I didn't think it was too big of a deal until we got off at the other side in Brooklyn, and then there was all sorts of traffic, and I'm thinking, wait a second, again, as I've mentioned a few times now, there's traffic, and we're on a limited time, and are are we going to sit there for a long time, and so forth and so on. But fortunately, that traffic was, I guess, going into Brooklyn and not waiting to get back on the bridge. So he made a right. Then I I think there was, even when he made that right, I think there were more cars beeping at him and whatnot. Yeah, and then once we get onto the bridge, there's a little bit of traffic because there's always traffic going from Brooklyn to Manhattan, in my experience. And then he missed yet another turn. So then he had to make another detour once we were back in Manhattan to get to my apartment. And it was just, it was ridiculous. Yeah, it was. It, <laughs> so he, there was the merging incident, the Brooklyn Bridge incident, and then missing the, missing the turn and then having to backtrack, like Jane said. And fortunately, it, it still didn't derail us. We were still able to get down there. We took the suitcase up to the apartment, had a quick look around the apartment, then decided it was time for Joe's Pizza, which... Every day when Jane would come home, she would say to me as she's getting off the subway and I'm talking to her while she's walking, she's like, I don't know what to have for dinner. And I always say, (laughs) I would say to her, how about Joe's Pizza? It's right there. It's what, half a block away or whatever. It's, I would say it was the midpoint between the subway and my apartment. So, and the subway wasn't that far. So it's, it was just something that's, and it's inexpensive and it's good and it's filling and uh, you can get that. What do you get that in? Sometimes a drink, and it's around twelve bucks. Yeah, like twelve, fourteen. Okay, so we had that, and then Jane started packing up, and I was looking around the apartment, and it's you know it's a shame about the apartment, but as we're sitting there, the couple of things really stood out to me that I don't know that I didn't realize from before. Jane's apartment is a quote unquote two bedroom. They're going to make it. A, they're going to make it a three bedroom now. Not legally a third bedroom because there's no windows. Right. No windows. The size of the the third room would be small, but it is passable. I looked up the law with that and that it does pass with the size. And I've known people that have lived in that apartment or have lived in that room before. Okay. So I'm looking around and one thing, Jane has always told me that this was really originally only a one bedroom. And when I was walking around while Jane is packing, I'm looking at the light switch for her room it's not in her room how far away would you say it is from your room Mm, like seven to ten feet it's on the other side of the living room is that right yeah okay so she would have to walk out of her bedroom door walk through the living room and then flip the switch and the light switch doesn't just turn on my room it turns on my room the living room and then the other room so if one person needs to turn on the light switch it goes on in all three rooms which is just crazy. And so Jane bought these cool lights, which were going to take the light bulbs out before she moves. I mean, moves out, I should say, because technically she's moved now. And the light switch, the lights can be controlled individually. Each light can be controlled individually with an app on her phone. They're Bluetooth. <laughs> Very cool. And then they have all these different colors. So we'll bring them. She'll take some to her new apartment. She doesn't have many hi-hat lights or lights in the ceiling there. So whatever she doesn't use there, we'll bring home and I'll either put them in Studio B or we'll put them out in the uh, hallway in front of Studio B. It's just crazy to think that it's like that here. So now you're going to have two bedrooms in a place that they can't control their light switch. And I feel bad for the person in that third bedroom because it's not just to walk across the living room. They've got to walk out of their room, do a 180 and then walk through the living room. Again, it's a New York City apartment, so it's really not huge. But still, if you're, you got to go in and into the room, they're going to have to have some other light, like a, a nightstand lamp or a desk lamp or something that they can turn on, then walk out and then shut the lights out in the other part. Or what if they go to bed early and they want the light out? How do they do that? Yeah, they're going to have to get Bluetooth lights, too. They're from Home Depot. <laughs> I highly recommend. Maybe I'll find them on Amazon, and it will be an affiliate link there. <laughs> Uh, So just thinking about it, and as we're talking about it, Jane told me originally those units were made as a one bedroom, which in this case, the one bedroom was Shannon's bedroom. 
And then the other two, there weren't any walls where that second and third bedroom were, or are, I guess. And it was a wide open spot. And it, at that space, that would be very nice because you'd have room for a living room, a dining room, and something else, a little, a little office area. And it would be nice. But also in that third bedroom, you have no air. Right there's no forced mm-hmm. air or any no radiator there's no heater there's no, nothing. no air conditioning spot there are some units in that apartment building where it's a two bedroom without that third bedroom so it's a big living room and then two equally sized rooms I don't know if that's also flex wall situation or what but and, that I feel like is a nice configuration and technically it's these aren't flexes like your Hanover Square apartment because they were. F- permanent walls yeah. here it's like a permanent flex wall yeah the a flex wall when they do the flex walls jane and her first two roommates had to actually put the walls up and they don't go all the way to the ceiling there's a gap of around six inches because of sprinklers and fire code, fire code and all that so it made and instead of a regular door it's like a barn door and same thing in that one <laughs> jane at least had windows and an air conditioning uh slash heating unit uh, Wayne in the other one had <laughs> had nothing. Uh, yeah, he was kind of subject to the to the the elements. Yeah. So, it, and at least though with his, it was in and just like this one, the third bedroom isn't against an outside wall, so less likely to be hot or cold. Again, the problem is you're not going to have any kind of air circulation. So we packed everything up. We get an Uber. Got a great Uber driver. Jane actually tipped him, and Jane never tips. No. I tipped the oh, I, I tipped him. I'm sorry. Yes, I tipped him, and then you tipped the guy going to back to the uh, let train. Let me just preface. I'm not stingy with tipping. I tip on things that are tippable. But when Uber first started, their whole premise was that you don't need to tip. So I think it's a little bit of a cash grab now. Also, a lot of the Ubers I have, have had are, are, were not tippable experiences. <laughs> and I guess it, you take it a lot more than... Uh, than I do here, as well as have uh, a lot of different <laughs> of different types of drivers there in in the city. I'm sure. Yeah, I've definitely probably almost died in an Uber multiple times. <laughs> so we get up to her new place, and I was kind of surprised how quickly we got up there. I thought it would take a lot longer. Again, I'm thinking we're going to go, I don't know, up eighth or something like that to get up there. I never. I never imagined, never thought that, hey, we could just jump on, um, I don't know what it is down uh, in downtown, but as West you go Side further Highway. up, yeah, well, it's West Side Highway further up. I think it's called West Street. Yeah. Uh, when we got on, when mom and I came uh, on Tuesday, it, it's, we did, it was, it's West Street and that's way below your place. Though. That's, that's near, that's ne- is near your old place, uh, the Hanover uh, Square apartment. Uh, but we took that and. The funny thing is, as we're driving up West Side Highway, as you get further up, maybe 60s or 70s, all of a sudden, the only thing on, as, as you're heading north, the only thing on your left is the river, uh, the Hudson River, and on your right, you don't even see buildings anymore. It's just you see trees on, on a berm, and it almost is like you're in the country. And into the suburbs. <laughs> exactly. And then you... As you get off, we, we get off at 96th Street, and as you got off there, all of a sudden you go through the berm and where the trees are, and all of a sudden, boom, there's a city. And again, not with the super tall buildings, but, you know, 15, 20 stories, maybe a little more here and there. Uh, it's certainly not like downtown or midtown, anything like that, but uh, is obviously a city once you get there. And maybe more residents, would you say? Yeah, it's definitely more residential up there. Yeah. So got out, got out of the Uber there, did what we needed to there, uh, tried to see the roof, uh, but the winds were so bad. They had the one door. When you go up the stairs, they had that shut. I'd love, I would have loved to have gotten some, uh, pictures from that. And one day I will obviously with uh, Jane living up there now, but, uh, you know, it's a nice place. It's a studio with, as I've told you before, it's got huge, huge closets. And, uh, that part is nice. So at that point, we get, after we finish up there, we figure out, we do some measuring. I take a video for Liz to watch, which she never watched because I guess it buffered and she didn't want to wait for it. And then she just FaceTimed us because I think she was walking Ziggy at the time when I sent her the video. And got the Uber and went back to Moynihan 
to get the train. And Moynihan is part of Penn Station. Uh, there's Moynihan is the new part. It's what the is, gentrified section. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing about getting there with the time that we had, we had, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour before our train left. So we did a couple of laps around. So I kind of got an idea of what was where. And the h- hilarious thing to me was I had gotten a Starbucks the last time I was in Moynihan uh, coming home from the Laugh for Sight event in October. I went to the Starbucks then, but I came at it at a di- from a different location. And <laughs> when we walked in the door, we walked maybe about 20 or 30 yards, and there it was. So now I really have an idea of how to get to it, whether I'm coming in the door or I'm coming from some other place in the station. So I could find that out. That just made it really helpful And Jane was also pointing out to me where the signs were for things. For example, the sign to go to 8th and 33rd. Which is closer to the Starbucks. Which is is very close to the Starbucks. And the place that, it's probably the easiest place to get out of the station. And unless maybe, unless I'm going to MSG or someplace like that, it's probably the best place to get out because that's where you can get out to get the Uber or to get a cab. Like Jane said, the cabs are right across the street at MSG. So now I have a great feel for it and what's where, which I don't know that I ever would have gotten unless I was there with somebody sighted because I could ask somebody, hey, where's the Starbucks? And they could say, oh, it's just down there and to the right. But I wouldn't know what everything else was around it. So we did get a good walk around. I figured out where bathrooms were still where they were. I knew where that was the last time, but it was nice to be able to do that. There are some other things coming. I was surprised to see that there's a full-blown Walgreens in there in case I, <laughs> I don't know, in case I need a Band-Aid. I don't know. I've gone there a couple times, so I bought an umbrella there, so don't knock it. Well, that I mean, that's good for you because you're getting off the train and going to go into town and go someplace, whether it's to work or to your apartment. I bought it for Emily's wedding. Okay, there you go. Oh, so you were getting on another train from there. I was going to the station. I had time to kill, and I didn't. I don't own an umbrella, or I didn't own an umbrella until that point. Okay. I bought an umbrella. I bought a water. I bought some candy, and then <laughs> I bought dinner, and then I went to the seated section before I went up to Poughkeepsie. That was the, the first day, and then I guess we didn't have any trouble catching the train coming home once we got to Philadelphia, and then once we, we were able to get on the SEPTA train. Oh, it was delayed. It was yeah, delayed. It was another twenty minutes. I would was say. it twenty minutes? Okay, yeah. That's a, so we obviously didn't wait outside for that because it's still. I think the high that day was eighteen, and we weren't going to wait outside. Now, I guess by the time we were back in Philadelphia, the winds here weren't nearly as bad as they were even in the morning. Like I said, I I still think they were worse in New York. It was fifteen degrees when we were when we got into Philly. Yeah, fifteen when we got there. Okay. Yeah. So we waited inside and finally realized that, hey, we better go up and wait at the train. When they, we heard the announcement next to arrive on track six, we went up and went outside and waited. And it wasn't that long of waiting outside and got on the train. And I, I guess we had no issues coming home. And that was it for that day. And, we, and surprisingly, we were able to get everything accomplished. And also one thing that we forgot to mention. So when we were rescheduling from the 23rd to the 24th, we were between a 5.05 train back and a 5.17 train back because they're 12 minutes, so what's the difference? We picked the 5.17 train, and thankfully we picked that train because the 5.05 train was canceled. No explanation, again, just how it said delayed on the board earlier in that day. It just said canceled and deceived the agents, not in like a flight 818 (laughs) it's been missing for five years type of Uh, It's 828, by the way. All in all, it was that part was good. Now, I found out a day or two later when listening to the radio, some people were in that train station for nine hours b- waiting really? for trains. Yeah, waiting, waiting for trains. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was Sunday or Monday. Uh, I heard on 1010 Winds that people were there. Again, because of all the weather from it, the weather wasn't bad just in the Northeast. It was all over, as you've seen now, even still with uh, Southwest having all their problems. Southwest Southwest Airlines and uh, other airlines right around Christmas. Same thing with the train and people were stuck there, like I said, for around nine hours. Uh, it sounds like that's the most people waited. Our original train was, I think, three hours and either 24 minutes or 44 minutes delayed. So it's a good thing we didn't wait on that one. And, and again, I don't know that we would have with not having any kind of update on timing. Uh, But again, we were fortunate to get everything done we needed to. Would we have liked to have gone, maybe had a look around the neighborhood? I don't know that we would have as cold as it was out. 
but it was nice that we were able to get everything that we needed to accomplish and uh, then be ready for Tuesday. So as we move forward, we got home. Uh, next day was Christmas. The day after Christmas, Jane took the train back to New York so she could go to her old apartment. That was the last night she'll spend there. And then she was able to pack up some other things that she didn't get to. And then Tuesday morning, the 27th, was moving day. The movers came a little early. They came at 8.45. And we were expecting sometime in the 9 o'clock hour. Liz and I left Philadelphia at Wells Worthmore at 8. 05, 802. We, we got actually, we got out and going pretty quickly. It's pretty close to target as we wanted to. And we were obviously communicating on the way up. Jane told me the movers were there and we were still probably an hour away. So we had stopped to get some tea and Liz a chai tea and me a breakfast sandwich at the Starbucks along the New Jersey Turnpike. But when we got there, the the line was eight to 10 deep and they are not the speediest bunch there in the Starbucks on the turnpike. They're, they're, they're not, they're not horrible. It's like a Target Starbucks. Yeah, there you go. And it's better that at least it's a Starbucks and not a Dunkin' because on the way home that afternoon, (laughs) we, we stopped at a place and both Liz and I were very disappointed. It was a Dunkin' and not a Starbucks, not knowing what we would get at Dunkin'. We didn't bother getting anything as we're getting closer to the holland tunnel jane said well we're they're finishing up we're gonna go i I ordered the uber they did it so fast these guys were very very quick and they were the same movers jane used when she moved from her downtown apartment to her upper east side apartment that she never lived in and paid rent on for a year because it happened during the pandemic she rented it with her friend who actually had to move in yeah, she lived there for... Six weeks? Six weeks, four weeks. So, four weeks. you know, Jane paid first month rent, and then I guess maybe four through... Maybe, so you didn't pay a full year. You paid maybe nine months, you think? Yeah, I paid first month's rent, and then I started paying again from August to February. Okay. Well, August to, yeah, February was when our lease ended. So, okay, so... But the movers were outstanding, and Jane texted me at one point. She said, the one guy's Ukrainian and the other two are Russian. And I'm thinking, Liz and I are wondering, how's that working out with... (laughs) with them and it worked out fine and they were they were awesome uh so if you're in new york city and you need a mover maxi is the name of the movers awesome both times everything got done quickly and i I actually broken nothing broken yeah just very very efficient and uh and it wasn't very expensive so they were they would be somebody uh what they cut you half an hour break because the one guy was late right yeah it was supposed to be three guys for three hours but I think for the first like 30 minutes, it was only two guys, but they still were able to pack up like 60% of my apartment in that time. Yeah, it just, it just worked out really well. And again, I was, I was kind of surprised at how quickly you can get from downtown to uptown, probably figuring as I did when I was up there for Laugh for Sight. And I took an Uber to the History Museum up by Central Park. We went right up 8th Avenue and just sat it probably took a half an hour 35 minutes i think that's what it took us once we got onto the island to go all the way up to where jane lives which was probably another uh 15 to 20 blocks 25 blocks and you know just by doing the west side highway so it just worked out well and everything was good i i you know we got things set up a little bit and figured some more things out with measuring and obviously, there's still going to be a bunch of stuff you have to do at this point, but... I only own a bed in terms of sitting furniture and a chair. Right, and the chair the chair came with it. It kind of looks like the Blue's Clues chair. Oh, yeah, you're right. Exactly. Or I was going to say big comfy couch. So still looking for some furniture, and we'll continue to look while, while Jane is home. So we're going back up. We're actually going to take her back. And we took Jane back after after everything got said and done with the movers. We went and had something to eat at a diner and got in the car and came home. Originally, the plan was to maybe go back downtown, get the other stuff and bring it back up. We figured maybe it would be easier if we came up on the second, which happens to be Jane's birthday. And we'll do that then. And this way she won't have to worry. The train tickets are super expensive. Both we paid a lot for that Saturday, Christmas Eve, which was actually a little bit more than we would have paid on the 23rd. And... But usually not too much more. 
no, it was only about 20 bucks for the train. And we probably could have gotten a, a lower price train depending on the timing. But the timing that we picked, figuring we'd have about six or seven hours, we thought that would be the best. I guess more of about five or six hours. We only had seven hours from the time we left Philadelphia to the time we were going to leave New York. For the most part, she's moved in. And uh, for me, the best part was we got to get into the city. We got to get some macaron from La Deray. And the holiday brioche is very good. Yeah, very good. And that's and that's the second flavor from them, limited edition, I guess. The second limited edition flavor that we really, really like. The other one was the, what was it called? Pumpkin praline? Or, yeah, a, I'm sorry, so. praline, as you say. Yeah. Is that what it was called? Yeah, yeah. I think it was pumpkin praline. Yeah, super, super good. And uh, again, I most of them I love, so <laughs> it's it's my go-to. And we actually we actually weren't anywhere near one when we were up there on Tuesday of this week. Learning the inside of that station was so important because now I know where everything is. And it's just so much more comfortable and easy when you know where you're going. Once you get outside, you can use a few different apps to figure out where you are, what way you're pointing. And especially with some of the places in New York, you kind of know okay, I'm going to leave the station at this exit and I'm going to be on this street and that street. And you can go from there. Now inside, I know where everything is and don't need to pull out my phone every five seconds. If you remember the last time I was there, my battery was running low and I'm trying to use Seeing AI or Envision to figure out what I was looking at and where things were. I even tried to use Good Maps, uh, which is something that I don't know if I've talked about in the past. I know Lauren from Amtrak has mentioned using that inside the stations to kind of figure out, help somebody who's visually impaired or blind get get around and figure out which way they're heading and what's near them and all sorts of things like that. Obviously, Google Maps and Apple Maps, they don't really work inside. No, and I would say that Moynihan isn't very accessible. The people are helpful, but I would say in terms of signage, especially if you're back towards the food section, it really... It's a crapshoot in terms of what you're looking at, what direction everything is, or even what trains are being called and coming to the station. Right. I don't even recall hearing, other than the people, the Amtrak folks who were at the different, call them gates for whatever, stairwells uh, for whatever reason, but they're the only ones that really said what was where. I don't remember hearing, were there announcements made, what was coming and what's, what track to to they, be on? They normally do. And I guess it's like not accessible for if you're hearing impaired, because if you're back in that food section, and this has happened to me before, they only, there's no boards up to say, this train is arriving, it's at this gate, so on and so forth. They'll only make those announcements. So if you think you hear, if you think you're boarding the 669, but really it's the 609, that might cause some panic. You might leave the line after ordering, which I've done before in the past, in a panic, thinking I was going to miss my train. So there's no boards up. So if you're in the back section with ordering food or just eating in general or just sitting back there, you can't see what's boarding. So besides being in that middle section where they have all the signage up where it's a little bit easier to see and hear, then, I don't know, there's some areas that aren't as helpful to be in. So that that part was awesome to get that figured out. So it was quite an eventful day that we had up there. And uh, I, I would say the move went, about as smooth as it could go, would you say? Yeah. Besides needing to go back to get more of my stuff. It'll be interesting to see what you gravitate towards as far as food goes. I know that you'll probably be going to, you saw the Fa Place, um, the Taco Guy, yeah, uh, taco Street guy. Taco, right? Street yeah. Taco. I mean, that sounded good. And again, the diner, I'm sure you'll... <laughs> I love <laughs> yeah. diner food. I'm sure you'll get some things. And all, again, very close to her, a block or two. And the the one bad thing about where she is, at her old apartment, she was near a, a place called Fulton Center or Fulton Transportation Center. Just about every subway line goes into that. So if you want to go just about anywhere on Manhattan or somewhere else in the city, you can go there and it was a block and a half away. That she won't have. There's only two lines that are very close to her. And, and which one are you near? One, the one? I'm near the one, two, three. So the red line. Okay. 
So something easy, and that'll get her to her office. And if we haven't mentioned, Jane works at Purple PR and does beauty public relations. So if you own a beauty company, which I'm not sure anybody who is listening would be listening to this if they do, but if you do or you know somebody who does and you need some PR representation, contact Jane and she will be able to help you out in great ways. I work in beauty PR and I've been doing it for over three years. If you want to get a hold of her, please reach out to me at the normal spots. I'll give them at the end. One more thing I wanted to mention, actually two more things I wanted to mention. I interviewed a gentleman named Aaron Spelker last week, and that was actually going to be today's episode. But the more I thought about our conversation, and I know I've talked about this before, I'm starting a second, I don't want to call it a second podcast, a second type of episode within I Can't See You called Blind Bosses. It's like a branch off. Yeah, it's a little bit of a branch off. And I thought, I'm going to use that as my number one episode, my first episode of Blind Bosses. So that'll come next week, along with another I Can't See You episode. And I talked to Aaron last week. He had a business, and he was a boss. He wasn't blind at this point. He went on vacation with his wife and a freak incident at the beach, blew sand in his eyes, getting a teaser, didn't think much of it. Not only did the sand cause a little bit of issues, but there was a bacteria in the sand and now he has only light perception and he has begun to, within the last year or so, and he's only been blind for three and a half years. He has begun to do game reviews for accessible games. Now, where this podcast is meant for sighted folks, and the audience is sighted folks trying to understand how blind people work and do other things, that's more for everyone, both sighted folks who don't think blind people can do anything, or for blind folks who don't think blind people can do anything. And this will show if you have the drive and the desire to do something, you can. So Blind Bosses Episode 1 will drop next week. I'm not sure what day because I haven't finished editing it yet. It was a great conversation. We talked for quite a long time. And then we talked for another long time after we got done recording. And I may have even recorded that part, but that's that was off the record stuff and uh, just chit chat between us. So Aaron Spelker in Blind Bosses episode one will drop next week. Also next week, Lisa and I had a conversation with a couple of folks from Foundation Fighting Blindness for White Canes Connect, and it will be the first episode of 2023 also dropping next week, also still needing to be edited. We talked to uh, these two folks about Foundation Fighting Blindness and how it's different from the NFB The FFB is a, they fund research projects to try and find cures and workarounds and whatever for retinitis pigmentosa and other diseases like that, age-related macular degeneration, things like that. And very different, also very different with the amounts of money they raise. I was tickled to death that we, when we did Believe You Can, raised almost two grand and talking to the person who was the president of the Pittsburgh chapter of the foundation fighting blindness. His name is Eric. He told us their goal for the last vision walk. They do one of these every year and it's their big fundraiser. Their goal was 95 grand, which is incredible. And I don't know where the, where the disconnect is, but NFB folks could probably learn some things from the FFB and maybe vice versa. But that will be coming. That will be episode 57 of White Canes Connect. Episode 56 is now available, which I think I talked about last week with Katya from the Keystone chapter, who is also president of the Pennsylvania Association of Guide Dog Users and also a huge advocate for guide dog users. She's got a lot of fire in her. So that's episode 56. Check that out. White Canes Connect, wherever you get your podcasts and you'll find White Canes Connect. Finally, it's this week's Just Listen. And unfortunately, I didn't have somebody approach me while I was shooting video asking me if I was playing the blind trick, but I did get some things. And here is a New York City version of Just Listen.
Qual estação? É ali mesmo? So that is all I have for episode 212 of I Can't See You. Please reach out, 646-926-6350. If you've got questions, comments, show ideas, tips, tricks, reviews, rants, whatever you've got, say whatever you want on the voicemail. Again, 646-926-6350. You've got up to three minutes. Please leave your name or a nickname and your town so I know who to attribute the call from. And if you don't want to do that, you can also reach out. I can't see you podcast at gmail.com. I can't see you podcast at gmail.com. Questions, comments, show ideas, whatever you've got. Suggestions for Jane on a couch for her apartment because she doesn't own one yet. And I don't want it to be delivered in April. Yes, that, that was one of the issues where you order it now, you get it in March or April. That means her lease will be at least a third of the way done. She'd like something sooner rather than later. And uh, please reach out again. And also on social media, at David Benj, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. You can also listen to the episodes on YouTube if you like. Coming next month in January, I will have some video of these episodes once I figure out how to do it and get a camera other than my mobile to do it. But you can look forward to those. As usual, show notes are available over on the website, he said. I can't see you.com slash 212. That's I can't see you.com slash 212. Remember, I can't see you sounds like a whole sentence, but it's only seven characters long. I C A N T C U.com slash 212. Thank you, Jane, for being a part of today's episode. I appreciate it, and hopefully, the listeners like it. You're welcome. It's a limited engagement. <laughs> She was also executive producing uh, for Blind Bosses, trying to help me find some music. I will be credited. (laughs) So you will hear that hopefully next week if I get everything together in time. Thank you again for listening to the final episode of I Can't See You for 2022. I hope you have a very happy and healthy and prosperous 2023. Be well, stay safe and warm, and I'll talk to you next week. Take care. Thank you for listening to the I Can't See You podcast with David. Please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. And don't forget to share the podcast with your friends.